here you were able to attend. Uh, yeah, just a reminder that the meeting is being recorded. Um, so we're gonna we're gonna start with a brief uh, LPNA update on a few different uh, LPNA business, and uh, Barbara's gonna Barbara Canap, our treasurer, is going to go over uh, a few items for us. She we have the end agenda on the on the screen right now, and she's gonna go through the LPNA business. Go ahead, Barbara. Okay. All right. So we have basically three main areas on the, on the agenda for LPA business. We're going to elect officers. Uh, then we're going to have an update on grants and some more specific project updates. So this is our time for electing our officers for next year. Uh, we went through the nomination period and uh, no, no new people stepped forward wanting to take on these uh, glorious positions. <laughs> so the same slate of people um, are have all uh, agreed to uh, to serve next year. So this is uh, we're going to do this as a slate since we have no other nominations, no contested positions. Um, normally in a in a in a face to face meeting, we'd say raise your hands. Um, but if you are a, a resident of La, the Los Paseos neighborhood uh, and you wish to object or or make a comment or or uh, abstain, uh, please put it in the chat or unmute yourself and speak. And if we don't get any comments within a short period of time, we will um, we will declare the slate elected. Speak now or forever hold your peace. Yeah. <laughs> but but be careful because speak now and you might get asked. <laughs> That's right. Uh, well, not not here, not seeing anything in the chat, and not um, and not hearing any objections. Uh, we declare the slate of candidates elected for uh, this the term beginning in January and running for one year, and then we'll go through this again next year. Great, right. and okay. that's that's the only piece of business on the on the agenda that is actually uh, of. of of organizational significance, really. Um, update on grants. I just wanted to let people know where we stand on, on the, the city grants that um, San Jose, apparently not all cities do this. San Jose very generously gives grants to neighborhood associations. We are running through a current grant year, which was extended because of COVID and actually ran for two years, a little over two years. Uh, we had $5,000 uh, and the grant ends December 31st. And we used it to support National Night Out, our native plant garden, um, the holiday event and the website costs. And um, we managed to spend most of it. We may give a couple hundred dollars back because if we don't spend it for an approved purpose, we have to give it back. But we, we tried really hard to spend as much of it as we could legitimately. Uh, we have applied for a new grant for 2022. Uh, for $3,600. We've got very short notice on this grant. We only had a couple of weeks to um, put together our, our application and it's not really possible to organize a, a big new project in that period of time and get it all costed out. Um, so most of the items will be the same national night out, um, more work in the park. Um, and we hope to have more face-to-face -face events um, in the coming year than we've been able to have in more recent times. Any questions on grants? Okay, so project updates. Um, Greg has been working with a scout on a project to put the uh, wooden signposts with street names in Paseo number two. It was done a couple of years ago in Paseo number one. And they are um, they are they are uh, very greatly appreciated by the people walking because then they if they need to get to a certain street they actually it is actually labeled now in an attractive way, um, and that project is moving forward. The my understanding is that the brackets have been installed that will hold the posts, and the next step is to actually uh, engrave, carve the street names into the posts, uh, and and then install them. 
One, one additional thing on that, Barbara, is that um, Paseo number no. three, which is across from Avenida España, will be done next. Uh, we talked with the city about that one. So we'll probably be asking for some volunteers from that side to uh, get that one updated also. Good. Great. Um, the other, then this was the, the biggest project in, in, our, in our grant this year was the native plant garden in Los Paseos Park. And it's been an, an ongoing process and we've been hurrying to try and get it all finished by the end of December. Uh, we've got news that the drip irrigation connection is scheduled to be installed in December and that's wonderful. Uh, I have a few pictures to show. This is the uh, test garden that we planted in April just to see if anything would grow in the tough clay. And actually they seem to thrive. So we were very encouraged by that. So we came back in the beginning of November with a, a hearty crew of volunteers and planted 24 more plants. And here's a picture. The plants look a lot bigger when you get down to their level and close up, <laughs> but they will grow. Uh, native plants take a little longer to grow, uh, but they will grow. And, and, then, and then eventually their growth will become a problem. But, and then the next step in the project was getting the new fence up. We had a temporary fence but now we've uh, put up the permanent fence and uh, we had uh, bo mostly board members in this volunteer group too. Uh, Lynn and Greg and Lynn's husband uh, helped get this up, but this was not a project that needed, a, a, it would have been even more chaotic than it was if we'd had too many volunteers. So um, those are the slides on the um, LPNA update. <clears throat> I'd like to uh, interject here for a second. Oh. Sergeant Hernandez, are you uh, constrained with time tonight? Oops. No, I'm not. I have somebody helping me out. Okay. You can go after District 2 or join in with District 2 update as, as you see fit. Thank you. So Vanessa, uh, we would like to um, hand it over to Vanessa Sandoval of our, our District 2 office, and she'll be given an update on the, uh, what's been happening around our district. Vanessa? Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for the time. Really appreciate it. Um, I am actually sending Greg uh, because I am on my phone. For some reason, um, my home Wi-Fi isn't working, so I'm using my cell phone. Uh, so I won't be able to share my screen, but I'm sending you, Greg, right now, the link to the current council map. So um, just some quick updates for everyone. I know it's um, later in the evening and folks have a lot of things to do. Um, so I'll just do a short presentation and then I'll be available for questions. I uh, wanted to start off talking a little bit about an important item coming to council next week on December 14th is uh, redistricting. So this has come before the city council in form of a public hearing on uh, November 30th. There was a second public hearing on December 7th. And um, also on December 7th, it was the initial council discussion on what those new redistricting lines are going to be. As many of you might know, every 10 years we have a census. And in order to make sure that our districts are balanced in terms of population, we have to revisit our district boundaries um, and make sure that we are uh, keeping together communities of interest um, and that we are not in any way diluting uh, certain groups um, in terms of their political power or their voting rights. And so the council has come together as of last week, um, actually this past Tuesday, sorry, this past Tuesday, um, decided to start working off of what they are calling the council map. Um, there were three maps submitted by the districting commission. Of those three maps, a consolidated map was put together by council member Cohen, who represents district four. And that's currently the map that we're working off of and the map that council member Jimenez is, is supporting. Um, so I just sent that link to Greg. I don't know if he wants to share it. I really encourage everyone to take a look at this map. Um, this map does make some significant changes to district two, in particular to the Los Paseos area. Um, basically what it does is it puts a significant portion of our southwestern part of the district into District 10. And that includes the Los Paseos neighborhood. Um, 
So I definitely would like to have your feedback on how you feel about this. Um, obviously, I think that regardless of who your council representative is, you are all a very organized, very engaged group. And I think that you will succeed regardless of who your representative is at City Hall. Uh, but this is definitely something that we would like to have your input and feedback on. Um, as it currently is drawn, we District 10 would come in along the Santa Teresa foothills all the way south in um, the, the, the eastern border would become Monterey Road. And so a good chunk of your neighborhood, um, pretty much all of Los Paseos and Santa Teresa would be um, taken in by District 10 and District 2 would be extended on the northern end of the district. Um, the current division right now is Snell Avenue and that would be extended west all the way down to, um, to Highway 87. Sorry, I've got a, a little one who wants me to hold him at all the wrong moments. <laughs> um, so those are those are the, the conversations that are being had at council. Council member Jimenez is supportive of the Cohen map, uh, which you can all see on the council agenda for next Tuesday. Um, it, 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 in our opinion, does the best at bringing together communities of interest um, and making sure that we're not diluting certain groups and making sure that we are keeping um, communities with similarities together. So for example, Los Paseos area, the demographics, the housing type, um, they are much more aligned with what is currently District 10. Um, and on the Northern end of the, um, the district, the side that would, the areas that would be swept into District 2 are much more aligned also similarly in demographics and housing type uh, with the Northern portion of District 2. Um, so that is the biggest item coming to council. We were going to do a review of the Charter Review Commission recommendations next Tuesday, but that has been deferred until early January, simply because there's just not enough time to take on both of these two items. Um, and then another very important update. I know, Greg, you said you had uh, wanted some updates on encampments in District 2 near Los Paseos. Um, if you have a specific encampment that you would like me to follow up with uh, the Homeless Concerns team, I'm definitely happy to do that, but I can tell you as of right now, we are still following the COVID protocols in terms of encampments. Encampments are only being abated if they're in sensitive areas um, or they pose an immediate risk to the health and safety of the surrounding community. And I know the argument is that there is no encampment that does not um, pose a risk and that is safe, um, but just because of CDC restrictions to try and prevent the spread of COVID-19, uh, we are not abating every encampment that's reported to the, to the city. Uh, many encampments, including most of them in District 2, at least the larger ones, the ones that are most visible, um, those are all receiving limited services. Some of them have uh, toilets and hand washing stations and other ones um, have at least trash pickup on a regular basis. So that's where we're at with encampments. Um, the bridge housing communities on Bernal and Rue Ferrari are both at capacity. They've actually been very successful in staying at capacity and providing services to folks as folks move in, um, as folks move out, new folks move in. So those are, are currently at capacity and the um, other two home key projects in district, well, there's, there's technically only one in district two, but the other one is very close to District 2, um, are still currently in the works. So for those of you who um, have paid um, close attention to these items, there are two locations in um, South San Jose where the city of San Jose is seeking funding from the state of California to create uh, some housing relief for low income, for low income families and for uh, previously homeless adults. So the residents in on San Ignacio. Um, there was a meeting uh, a couple weeks ago and the housing authority is actually taking the charge on this um, site. They're gonna, they're, they are the ones that are applying for the grant. The grant has yet to be submitted. My understanding is the timeline is to get it in by the January 15th deadline. Uh, they hope to have an application in before the holidays, uh, but it might be early January when that application is submitted. So we won't know if we receive the funds from the state of California to purchase that hotel 
until probably about uh, sometime in February. It takes about 45 days for the application to be processed and for a final uh, decision to be made. So if it's submitted in early January, we're not going to know until probably early March, if it's submitted over the holidays, and we'll know maybe in late February, um, whether or not the funds were were uh, granted to the housing authority to purchase the residents in. And the residents in the current um, uh, plan as of now, uh, which I don't expect it to change, um, is that it would become an apartment complex for low-income families, uh, families who are currently suffering from homelessness, families at risk of homelessness, and also families who have been uh, victims of domestic violence and are in need of immediate um, of immediate shelter. So this is not like the bridge housing communities. It's a permanent uh, location where people would reside permanently and where they would be able to receive on-site services. Um, that is my home key update. Oh, just a real quickly on Branham Monterey. That is a bridge housing community um, that is intended for adults. Um, and they also, the housing department is still working on that home, crea home key application. Um, and once that's submitted, probably along the same timeline, uh, we'll get some update on whether or not we get those funds and whether or not that bridge housing community can be built on the corner of Monterey and Branham, which is kitty corner to the Eden Bell Library. Um, in terms of opportunity housing and SB 9 and 10, there are some important items coming to council next week. Um, the city council will be uh, reviewing a recommendation from both the planning commission and our planning staff to cease work on a opportunity housing ordinance uh, for the city of San Jose. And this is because both the planning commission and the planning department are recommending that the city focus on the implementation of the state bills that were currently passed. Um, I expect that council will accept the staff recommendation on that and that we will uh, begin uh, basically creating development standards for how to implement um, SB 9 and 10, which is state law that was signed in uh, to law by the governor. Um, and so there would not be any continued effort to create a San Jose ordinance related to opportunity housing, but rather we would look at what the state is mandating cities and um, municipalities to do and figure out the best way to implement that for our city. Um, that's sort of where we're at on opportunity housing. As I talk to Greg and other folks through the Neighborhood Leadership Council, uh, folks who are really interested in this and want to see what the city's plans are for implementation of the state legislation, I definitely recommend an invitation uh, from your neighborhood association to a planning department representative so that you can get all of the um, intricate details of, of how this may or may not impact your, um, your community. And I think that's pretty much it. Oh, the one last thing that I did want to update everyone on is um, safe parking. Um, so you are all very close to a VTA lot that's currently unused over on uh, San Ignacio and Santa Teresa. Um, this lot is being proposed as a safe parking site for RVs. Our office receives many, many, many uh, concerns from residents and businesses in Edenville Technology Park in particular um, about RVs parking on city uh, business corridors and in residential streets and basically um, creating some health and safety concerns for residents as well as not being the most the ideal place for um, an RV to be located. And so Councilmember Jimenez is working with the housing department as well as VTA to figure out a lease agreement for use of this parking lot uh, for safe parking for RVs. It would be similar to the site that we had over at Southside for about two years where folks were allowed to park. Uh, the difference would be that this would be a 24 hour lot. It would be specifically for RVs um, and it would provide services um, as well as um, uh, utilities, uh, access to utilities so, so that the RVs could properly dispose of their waste um, and, and be connected to, to um, services that could hopefully help people get to permanent housing. Um, the timeline for that right now is that the city is working with VTA on a lease agreement. Once a lease agreement and terms are agreed upon, it has to come before the city council for full, appro full approval. That'll probably happen sometime in February. Additionally, a RFP, a request uh, for a proposal went out to a service provider. We need to hire a service provider to, um, to come in and, and run and manage the facility uh, or the, the, the site and to provide um, 
services to the folks who are going to live there. So that RFP went out um, early December, and they're hoping to get some responses before the end of the year. And then also that would have to come before the city council for approval. So we're looking at about a two month span on this. Um, there will also be probably in mid to late January, a community meeting on this, uh, where we will um, make sure that we invite everyone, all of our neighborhood associations, all of our community leaders to come out and share your concerns um, and to make sure that we are addressing any concerns from residents about the use of this location for safe parking for RVs. Um, and so that's it for me. Hope everyone has a very happy holiday. Um, City Hall will be closed for Christmas and New Year. Um, so there's about four days the, where, where City Hall is not open from the 27th through the 29th and then also the 30th through the 1st. Thank you. There's a question in the chat um, from someone. Is, is the bridge housing and low income housing residents in, et cetera, and safe parking lots being distributed equally amongst the districts? That is a good question. Um, uh, if you look at some, if you look at the most recent maps where uh, affordable housing and where uh, interim housing is being proposed, being built and where it currently exists, there is not equal distribution across all of the districts. Um, there are a few districts that are lacking uh, significantly in their participation, in particular District 1 and District 8. Um, and that has been thus far because unfortunately the, the, the land is just not available in those areas um, or we haven't found you know, appropriate locations in those areas. But city, the city council is currently working on um, a plan for equitable distribution of uh, affordable housing sites as well as interim relief housing sites. And so that is definitely on the council's mind and it's definitely a, a, um, the intent of the council to provide these services across all districts. Um, I think it's gonna be a little bit of time before we're equally all providing the same amount of units across the city. Uh, but I would like to say that San Jose District 2 is not by any means in the lead on this effort. Um, there are many more affordable housing units as well as interim housing units in other districts such as District 7, District 6, District 3, um, and even District 9 is actually uh, has more um, affordable housing complexes than District 2 does. So I know that there had been some, some questions and some concerns about District 2 being disproportionately impacted. Uh, we definitely are at this point in time stepping up and taking the lead on um, some of the interim housing relief solutions, um, but we are definitely not in the lead in terms of units being provided across the city. Chantilly, did that uh, answer your question for now? Yes, thank you. Oh, another, another really important key point on the um, the safe parking for RVs. Council member Jimenez has directed staff and city council has approved to this recommendation uh, to prioritize RV dwellers currently within the district. Yeah, um, yeah. I think there was there was some concern about whether we were gonna be moving RVs in from district four I, or from I, district I three. That with someone from the group. Yeah, um, and, and, and yeah, that you is- you guys are talking, that's fine. That is not okay, the case. <laughs> Um, the the uh, RV site is intended for those RVs that are currently already in District 2, in particular those around that immediate area in Eden Bell Technology Park and up at Rue Ferrari uh, to get those folks moved into um, these sites so that, so that we can alleviate some of the concerns that are currently being created by the RVs parking on residential streets and business corridors within District 2. That's a great point. Thank you. If there's anyone Any, uh, at the meeting here that would like to have further information uh, down the road here, please let me know by um, email or next door, Greg Peck. Any other questions for Vanessa before we go talk to Sergeant Hernandez? All right. Thank you, Vanessa. Thank you, everyone. I'm not going to uh, stay for the full meeting. Um, just wanted to thank everyone for your time. And it, uh, if you have any questions for me, please feel free to contact me directly or you can contact um, Greg and I will share my email in the chat for everyone. Thank you. Thank you.
All right, Sergeant Hernandez. Okay. You have an update for us for our area, like you've done before. Just yeah. Um, you know, I couldn't get uh, the neighborhood uh, specific stats, but just looking at uh, the beat, um, there's nothing really that stands out. I have you guys have normal, the typical types of calls. Um, I know that during one of the last uh, meetings, one of the concerns was the racers, the organized racers that were taking over certain parts of this uh, of of the city, specifically down um, some down here off of Monterey, et cetera. Um, during the last um, organized op operation against the racers, uh, they pretty much stopped doing the organized uh, racing because um, one of the, or the promoters got uh, an injunction served against him. So if he was to post anything on social media, he'd get into legal trouble. So some of that organized stuff has gone down, but now we have the impromptu races and uh but we're still trying to you know head uh to those areas before they happen or just kind of if we hear see any uh groups of racer type vehicles going anywhere we'll mobilize some racer enforcement teams follow them um stop them cite them for equipment violations and try to break up the the racing stuff um looking at the calls for service in your area the most the most significant event happened uh, in the area of 7,000, the 7,000 block of San Teresa, where there was an uh, armed robbery, but um, no one was hurt. And other than that, the typical um, music calls are, are being called in. Um, there was a couple of package thefts off of Avenida Rotella. Um, but other than that, you get, uh, you get your rather safe neighborhood compared to some other parts of district yellow compared to uh um yellow three which is over by santa Teresa hospital by yellow one which would be blossom hill santa Teresa, or the blossom hill corridor and now we have a full team we have six six officers on this side of the week so you, you do have uh, officer jared peterson assigned to your beat thank you Sergeant, um, someone mentioned to me the other day regarding um, police officers patrolling the area and being more visible. And somebody mentioned it would sure be nice to see a police officer as he comes by stopping his car and taking a little stroll through our wonderful park over here and then back to his car and, and yeah. go. Is that, would that something like that be possible to just- Yes, yes, um, I, have, I have asked my team to go to their respective, uh, sorry, turn this in, to their respective beats and drive around when they, when there's free time. Um, they're usually handling calls. I do go through the neighborhood. Um, I go down, um, so San Ignacio crosses over into your side and then Avenida Rotella. I go around Avenida Rotella, go towards the school. Um, I come out Avenida España and then I go down Santa Teresa towards uh, Sheltingham, um, Bayless area, and then come through the neighborhood, through the other side of the neighborhood. Um, but I will reiterate uh, to them that you, that you would like to see them more often. Um, so I also go through the parking lot of the, the grocery outlet. Um, since I'm the one that has more free time than they do, they're the one that answering the calls. Um, but absolutely, it's, it's something that they should be doing anyway without me asking. That way they are familiar with what's going on in your neighborhoods. Appreciate your attention to our, our area down here south of Brunel. Really uh, do appreciate that. Yeah. Anybody yeah. have any other questions for Sergeant Hernandez? Yeah. Okay, and I, I take it by being quarterly, your next one's probably gonna be March? Sometime in March. Um, Greg, you're on mute. Yeah. I'm sorry. I keep going off and on mute. I'll let you know as uh, as soon as possible, Sergeant. Okay. Now we, I'll I'll ask our uh, crime analysis to send me some stats specific to your neighborhood, and I can give you a better idea and, and stuff like that. Okay. All right. All right, folks. Have a good one. Happy holidays. Hey, Greg. Hold on a second. Greg. 
I posted a message in the chat. Yep. Well, that's a good question, Sergeant. If we get redistricted, 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 does that impact our PD coverage? No, no, they're two different things. They, they, the, um, so the we'll still be grouped districts, yellow. <laughs> yeah, the, the police districts will still will remain the same. We're not we're not divided by because there's 16 police districts and there's only 10 council districts. So it it makes no difference. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, folks. All right. Thanks a lot for stopping in. Appreciate no it. Problem. Bye bye. Thanks. All right. Mm -hmm. So, Anita, are you available to share your screen? Yes. Cool. Go for it. Oh, let me make you co-host. I'm sorry. <laughs> Got to make you co-host first. Let me find you here. Where are you? Oops. Uh, Anita, you didn't you you weren't on for the beginning of our, our presentation, but in our LPNA update, we showed some slides of the native plant garden that we just put in in Los Paseos Park. Oh, nice. And we're hoping it's it's planted now. It's going to take a while for it to mature. This but, is the perfect time for you for it to yes. start growing. Yes. So when we and we just put up a nice fence to keep the dogs out. And uh, we are we are hoping that I, I, we're going to get you know plant identification signs up and, and a sign explaining that it's it's sort of a kind of a demonstration garden in in a way, and hopefully people will see it and and find that gee there are some pretty plants that flower a lot of the a lot of the time, and uh, and we'll encourage other people. That's great. Okay, so. Also, could you introduce yourself again? Sure. Do you see my screen? Yes. Okay, let me just mute. Okay. So you see my uh, deck, right? Yes. Okay, great. Okay, so um, my name is Anita Rosen, and I am a master gardener. And for those of you that don't know, uh, Master Gardener is a uh, program out of UC Davis. It's a volunteer program. And volunteers like myself, we join the program, we go through, UC Davis provides a fantastic training program. And our goal is to um, bring that information out to our community. So uh, we're, I'm Santa Clara County, a master gardener. There's about 300 of us in Santa Clara County and we have demonstration gardens. And uh, we do a lot of training out into the uh, um, county. So um, we also have, we have a hotline that you can call. Master, if you just go to our website, Santa Clara County Master Gardeners, you can get the link to our um, hotline and you can call up uh, the people that are manning the hotline and ask them questions. Um, we also have a website. We have a monthly email that we send out with gardening tips and news. Um, we have demonstration and research gardens that are open to the public. Uh, we have spring events like Spring Garden Market where we sell plants. And then like what you're experiencing tonight, um, classes and talks. And if you want more information on us, you can go to, we also have all kinds of talks that we have um, that are put up um, on YouTube. Um, if you just have to remember Master Gardeners, you'll be able to find us. And uh, there's our website. We also have a Facebook page where we, every day we put up a tip or a bloom alert or information. Um, same thing with Instagram. And then um, usually every other week we have a free monthly plant clinic. Um, during COVID they moved from physical to online but you can then show your plant. And we have uh, Master gardener, knowledgeable people will tell you why you're having problems and what you can do. So there's a lot of resources and it's all free. So today I'm gonna to be talking about water wise gardening. And that's my personal area that I care about is um, the issues that we have with drought. And I'm um, 
I like flowers. I like to have a lot of flowers in my garden. So I want to be able to keep having flowers in my garden, but I don't want to use a lot of water. So what are the techniques to have a beautiful garden and not use a lot of water? That's what I look at. So what we're going to cover in the class is better watering techniques, better landscaping techniques, cool tricks to save water, and um, what you need to know to make smart decisions. What's not covered is choosing plants, landscaping, and setting up a drip irrigation system. Um, I'm not a landscape gardening specialist, so I can't tell you what you need to do, but I can tell you um, what you need to know. So to start off with, commercial growers can show us um, the way. In um, Israel and Australia, almond growers use 15, 1,5% of the amount of water that many Californian almond growers use to grow the same crop. And they don't have the Sierras in Israel and in Australia. So the farmers there, they don't have a source of water. They just have what comes um, from the sky pretty much. So they have to use really smart watering techniques and we can learn from them. Um, so how do they do it? It's shockingly simple. They mulch, they use drip irrigation, and they use probes and satel um, satellites to know when to water. And that drops their use from flood irrigation, which we still have a lot of Central Valley farmers use flood irrigation, and they use smart irrigation. And that's by far not to say that all California farmers um, use flood irrigation. There's a lot that are using smart irrigation techniques, but unfortunately water is free in the Central Valley. So there's a lot of farmers who haven't invested in smart water techniques. So the first thing, we're gonna start at the very basics is if you're gonna be using water in your garden, the first thing you need to know is how to measure water flow. So that's me in my backyard with a five gallon bucket. And what I do is I turn the water on and you don't necessarily have to turn your water on as hard as it goes. You wanna, if you're hand watering, you should turn it on at the same rate that you usually turn it on for hand watering. Because what you wanna know is how, what's your flow so that you know how long to water. So turn it on to what you usually use for if you're hand watering and then see how long it takes to fill up a five gallon bucket with water. And uh, so if your fill time is one minute, then your flow rate is five gallons per minute. So it's just a number that you, that you need to know and it's pretty easy to do. And then you can take your bucket of water and water your pots. So I'm gonna ask a question now, have any of you measured your water flow? Are you container gardening? I also, two, so two questions, question one, and if you can go over to the uh, chat section and say one, have you measured your water flow, yes or no? And two, are you container gardening or gardening in the soil? So do you have containers on your patio? Um, are you planting in the ground? Are you doing both? So number two, so we have an idea of how much time, I kind of want to have an idea so I know where I should be focusing my energy for the next section. And I believe someone's helping me. Um, Anita, I'm supposed to be helping. I'm still having some computer problems. So oh. I maybe, Greg, can you see the chat? Right. Uh, my my right. chat is frozen. Okay. I can only see chat if I get out of this and it's just too complicated for me to get out and look at chat. Okay. So Greg, if you could read the chat. Oh, I just, it just came up for me, Greg. So I'll, I'll okay. do it. Oh, Sorry. Hi, Karen. Hello. <laughs> I've had been having computer problems. I apologize. So um, we have Gina, no to first, yes to second. We have a no, I guess one no, one no, never measured, used drip for most part, a few containers, uh, both uh, two or both, 
measured one person's measured water two is no it's just a combination you know okay. one no two both one no two both okay one no container anita one thing i've done in my um i have a drip irrigation system and i planted some uh plants in my front yard that don't take much water yeah. i went up to the uh, water meter out in the street and i turned on each program and I measured how much water was flowing per minute. And um, so I have that database there set. And I kind of do that like once a month or so um, to see if I have any of my drip system that has blown a drip head or something like that. I want yes. to make sure it's consistent. And then I can also be able to tell how many minutes I have to drop to maybe reduce my water flow by 10% or whatever. So that's how I'm trying to do that. That's a really great solution. Um, if you're doing hand watering, what I was showing you before is a really good way of, because a lot of people go out there with their um, hose and they water. How much water are you watering? I mean, you stand there for a minute and you could be dropping five gallons on one plant and that plant probably doesn't need five gallons. So it's a good way to know how long you should be standing there with your hose. So what we do recommend, so the next question I have that I'm always asked is, so how much should we be watering? How much water do plants need? The rule of thumb is one inch of water per square foot. So what that means is an inch of water is two thirds of a gallon. And I have in parentheses 0.62 because it's actually 62, but it's about two thirds. And um, we're going to use that number in a later calculation. So you know how much you need to be watering. In hot water and hot weather, and you guys are, I'm a little, I'm North County, you guys are South County. You guys get hotter than me. So on really hot days, it's 105. Your plants probably need more water. So you kind of think about that. Um, we're not arid, so we don't need to double it. So this is an example. This is a four by 16 foot vegetable bed. So these are all plants, vegetables use a lot of water. They're not drug tolerant plants. And so you probably wanna put your vegetables close together, all together, as opposed to spread around your garden, because that way you can, you, well, we'll talk about that later. Um, so in this vegetable bed, how much do you need to water? Well. If it's a, it's a four foot by 16 foot vegetable bed, that's 64 square feet. So if our water flow rate is five gallons per minute, 64 square foot feet by two thirds of a gallon is about 40 gallons that we're going to need to drop on this bed. So time to hand water, if it's five gallons, for one minute, then it's eight minutes to water with a hose, that garden. If it's five gallons per 10 minutes, then you need 80 minutes. And we're not talking about each time you go out there, that's for an entire week. So if you go out and water twice a week, you're gonna be watering for four minutes if you have it, if you're doing you know, five gallons a minute, you have your hose all the way turned up. That's why I was saying, how long does it take to fill up that five gallons because you just want to know what your flow rate is so you know how long to water. One of the things I recommend to people who are watering pots by hand, how much do you have? Let's say you have a one gallon watering can. Um, you know that plant needs two thirds of it a week of that can. So if you have, you know, what you can do then is you fill up your can, you go out there three times a week, you fill up your can and you walk around and you use one watering can for you know, five, six plants. You water them. So I'm just trying to give you an idea of how to figure out how much, when you, they say one inch per square foot, you kind of figure one square foot per pot. So each of those pots are gonna need an inch or two thirds of a gallon per week. 
Anita, um, there's a question in the chat about sure. so soaker hoses. Um, I'll get to that. Okay. I'm just want, want, I first want to start with the manual piece of it. If we're just hand watering, okay. how long do we hand water? We want to give, you know, two thirds of a gallon a week. So we can kind of do the arithmetic from there of how much your plant needs and how often you need to water. So the next one, well, I guess, Greg, that's just leading into this next one. Okay. So a lot of us use drip. I use drip, uh, but I also hand water because on my patio, I have a lot of plants that I hand water. So for drip, um, I would say one of the more common drip emitters is a half a gallon of water per hour. So, which is two thirds of a gallon of water per square foot per week. That's what numbers we're working with. So how long do you water? If you water every day, you'll need to run your sprinkler for 12 minutes if you're using half a gallon drip emitter. If you water three times a week, you'll need to run your sprinkler for 30 minutes. If you water twice a week, you need to run it for 45 minutes. And if you run, if you water once a week, you'll be running it for an hour and a half if you have a half of gallon per hour drip. So um, of course things are different depending on if you have sandy soil or clay soil, but in Santa Clara County, we are really lucky. Uh, one of the exercises that we did in Master Gardeners is testing our soil. And we had people across the county and almost everyone came up with the same answer. There were very few people who didn't have, we have a sandy clay mix which some people complain, they go, oh, it's, it's too clay. You want a little bit of clay, it holds the water in. You don't want the sandy because it just all, you just lose your water. So we've got really great soil here how because it can hold the water. How do you so are, we, are we in the middle of that with that picture, sandy loam versus clay loam? Are we somewhere exactly. in the middle? Okay. We would be right in the middle. Okay. So, the next piece that we're talking about, I gave you an idea of how long you need to water, but there's some tips that we can do to make our watering better. So the goal is, is not just how much you need to water, but we want to water deeply. If you water and the water all is on the surface, then it evaporates and it's not getting down to the roots. If you grow your plant's roots shallowly, then they dry out quicker. So the goal is we also want to get the water as deep as possible because we want to grow deep roots because it creates better plants, stronger plants. So, so there are some tips that we can do to get our roots deeper. So this is my own little picture. You can see what kind of artist I am. If you water for five minutes, what I'm trying to illustrate here and the how many inches this is, um, it really depends upon the soil, but we're, I'll use this example. If you water for five minutes, the water will get about, we'll just say five inches deep. And then over the next 10, 15 minutes, it will go, it will sink down and go another like five inches. If you water for 15 minutes, the water will go about 10 inches deep and then sink down another five inches. But what we recommend you do is cycle. Because if you cycle five minutes off, five minutes on, 15 minutes off, what you do is you, the water will go down for the five minutes on about five inches. Then it will settle another five inches. And then when you water again, it will go deeper. So it will go down to 15 inches. And then when it sits and waits for another 10, 15 minutes, it will go another five inches deeper. And then when you water again, it goes deeper. So by cycling on and off, you can get your water to go really deep. So a better use of your water, you're growing longer roots and that deeper water doesn't evaporate. So what I do is I have like in the front, I have four different zones and I just have my zone set up. My watering zones is five minutes on, goes to the next zone. Five minutes on, goes to the next zone. So it goes through each of those four zones and then I have to do it again. 
And again, so I have three times my zone cycle through and they each last about five minutes. And my water goes much deeper. So I'm getting better use of my water. My I need water. some, oh, sorry. And uh, sorry, if somebody asked a question in the chat. Uh, does the regular drip system have this cycle option? All I know sprinkler, they do. All of them do. I had, I replaced mine with a newer version, one of the one, an internet um, controlled controller, but my old one that was about 20 years old had a cycling um, ability. It's just harder to program with the old, you know, 20 year old ones, you have to manually program. But yes, they have it. The question also comes up is seedlings. What do you do about seedlings? Um, seedlings need the same amount of water. They still need that inch of water. The difference is, is they need it more often. So if you're starting your garden, you're probably gonna water them every single day for a short period of time. And as they start to grow, you're going to water them less often, but deeper. So you might be watering for five minutes every day, and then you'll water them for 10 minutes every other day, and then 15 minutes every third day as they get bigger. Because our goal is to grow really deep roots, because then you don't have to water as often. So the next question people say is, what about lawns? Are they the same? Yeah, a traditional lawn needs one inch of water a week, the same as all the other plants. So if you water twice a week, you'll need to run your sprinkler for 15 minutes. If you water three times a week, you'll need to run your sprinkler for 10 minutes to give you an idea. Um, and again, you should be cycling your sprinkler because you wanna grow deep roots. Because the deeper the root, um, the longer that earth is wet. So the healthier, the less watering you have to do because you water the water, when you have deep water, the plant has water for a longer period of time. So you can easily tell when people don't deeply water. This is around the block from my house. And you can see there's and trees. And this is what it looks like, the effect of shallow watering on trees. They pull all their roots to the top. And it's a very unhealthy tree. So very dangerous. Yeah, it's a dangerous situation because you want the tree to have deeper roots because they, you know, a big storm comes through and that tree can fall over much easier. So I'm curious to know, is anyone here managing their water to grow deep roots? I, I set my program to start early morning, say for instance, three o'clock in the morning. And then if I do a, 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 a program, a certain area, and I water for 15 minutes, I wait two hours or three hours and then do it again. Uh, you mentioned like 15 minutes. I'm not sure if it's... I don't think an hour or two is going to make a big difference because okay. the, the big issue that we don't, you know, if I, I talked, I had four zones, so it's about 20 minutes. If you had six zones, it would be about a half an hour. Uh -huh. um, the big issue is you don't want the water to dehydrate between the first time you water and the second time you water. Yeah. Because if we, you know, how viscosity works, if you water and it's wet, that water is just gonna go right through where it's wet and move on to where it's dry, move farther down. So that's why we wanna make sure that we, the next time around, the earth is still wet. So in the chat, um, uh, Smita says, no, this is the first time I'm even hearing of this concept, me too. <laughs> I think it's amazing. I've never heard of it before. Uh, Mike uh, Van Dam says, no, he's not doing it. Um, Barbara asked a question, do same guidelines apply to native plants, less water, but still cycle? Yeah, it applies to everything because the goal is to get uh, water deep. Because we use less water. If we, we always keep it shallow, it's running off, it's on the surface, it's not getting where we want it. We want it deep. 
So some other watering tips that make a difference, because we're going to be spending money on this watering. We want to make it work for us. So the best time, as Greg was saying, he waters in the middle of the night. The best time to water is early in the morning because it reduces evaporation caused by sun and wind. Um, it's also recommended not to water in the early evening around dusk um, or before midnight, because if this is, you might say, I've never had this problem, but this is a problem you could have. If the water is sitting on your plant's leaves, it's a great um, environment for fungus and mold. Mm. So that's why it's better to water. You don't want to water during the day. The worst thing to do is water to the day because it's called evaporation. You want to make sure your watering is getting deep and getting into the soil to the roots. Um, also to note, and a lot of people don't realize this, is a lot of plants like to dry out between watering. It's like one of the other things, kind of a little off topic that I see in the summer when it's really hot, people go, oh gosh, the leaves on my tree, on my plant are all wilted. And they go out there and run out there at five in the, five in the afternoon to water their plant. Don't. A lot of plants, that's how they deal with heat. And when you water it, it really messes up the, um, the ecosystem for them. It's much better off if they're still wilted in the morning, they need water. So don't worry about your plants if they're wilted in the afternoon on a hot day. They're just managing how heat. Um, and don't forget to turn off your water in November. And we had a really early rain um, in October and that's when I was like thrilled I could turn my water off. But we need to manage because we didn't have any water from what was at the entire month of November. So uh, but dew is also a way of watering for plants. So monitor what your soil is like. I'm not saying you have to go out there every day, but you kind of like, you can look at a plant and see if it's having problems because it's not getting enough water. So water budgeting is something else that we talk about. Um, and I started alluding to it earlier. So water budgeting means taking like plants. And when I say like plants, like needs of plants. So behind here, there's a picture and they have raised beds for um, vegetables. And um, so they all need probably similar type of water. Trees need different types of water. Um, your natives will need a different kind of water. So um, when I say different kind, it's all the same water, it's just how, how much water they need. So um, you should put like needs of water together. You shouldn't put natives in with your vegetables because um, the natives will not be happy. They don't like to be watered in the summer. So we wanna keep similar type plants together. Um, another one is to save our trees with watering. So um, the best way to water a plant, a tree is not with your drip irrigation system every week or in your grass. Um, that's not the best way to water a tree. 30% um, of the trees in the Bay Area are dead or dying because of the sustained drought that we have. So we do have a crisis going on right now in the Bay Area with our trees. And we really need to be monitoring the trees that we can manage, which is our, in our yard. So instead of watering them on your drip irrigation system, a better way of watering your trees is a deep water because they're big and their roots should go really deep. So we do a super deep watering, where is um, you choose three points on the tree, so there's the tree, the first thing you want to find is the drip line. And it's really kind of intuitive when you think about it is um, rain comes down, hits the leaves, goes along the canopy and drops off right at the end of the tree's canopy. And that's called a drip line because, and that's where the tree is going to have a lot of roots. 
because they know there's going to be a huge amount of water that comes off their leaves onto their drip line. So that's where they're going to put the majority of their roots right around the edge of their canopy. So we choose three different spots in a triangle around the canopy and you take your hose on a pretty low rate and you let it um, drip. Um, you want to get about five gallons. So you don't want to have five gallons in one minute because it's all going to run off. So you want to get five gallons over a course of one to three hours. And you place it on the three different points and you let that water get really deep. And that's how you feed your trees. It's the most efficient way of feeding your trees water in the summer. And it's typically June, July, August, September. Because by June, it's probably been over a month since we've had rain and that the, the um, earth is starting to dry out. So and how often, do we do, I, how often do we do this? I do it once a month. Once a month, okay. So I usually do it middle of June, middle of July, middle of August, middle of September. Somebody's asking if we cycle this as well. Like, um, you know. You, you don't have to cycle it because you're just doing a slow drip. So what I do is, again, you know, like earlier, I said, how much do you, um, if you want to know, you know, you have the five gallon, I mean, you could also do it with a one gallon, but if you have the five gallon, do a slow drip and see how long it takes me, you know, instead of five gallons, it might be easier just to do one gallon, but how long does it take for a gallon to get out with, into one gallon. How long does it take to fill one gallon on a very slow drip? And that will tell you how long you need to be out there. But I find that I'll just get like a, probably the diameter of like a foot or two when I have a very slow drip, which tells me the water is going deep because I'll have it running for about three hours on a very slow drip. Hmm. Uh, there's another question. Any sure. thoughts on the use of earth boxes that use water in the bottom of the tub that is soaked up by the dirt and plants? They grow large plants. Yeah, yeah. Um, I am not an expert in that. I did, you know, there are some master gardeners who are really into the, the hydroponic, I think that's how they call it. Hydroponic. 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 Um, so I don't really, you know, I think you're outside of my level of expertise. I know other master gardeners are really into that. And that's not using earth. They're just have it in these vessels and they use water. So not an area that I really feel comfortable talking about. Okay. So we've been alluding to this smart controllers. You can use a dumb controller, just a manual controller. They all have these kind of settings. It's a hundred times easier using the modern ones that are the smart controllers because you go in there and it's, you know, you can use your computer or your phone to set up um, your, uh, your schedule. And uh, so it's easy to set up and uh, they can also, a lot of times they're set up and they're connected to the weather report. So you can set up that if it's going to be like over 105 degrees, you're going to water longer so that you can have, you know, do an, an additional cycle or if it's going to rain then that you don't water at all. So instead of you having to think about it, you can set it up with one of these uh, smart controllers. Is there any particular brand that you recommend? No, <laughs> there isn't. I had one and the company went under, but, but it was, one of the, you know, they just started coming out with them about five years ago. So no, I have to get a new one. <laughs> I'll have to be asking around. You can come look at mine, Karen. It's pretty nice. It, it's controlled. I can control my water with my phone. I can turn on, on and off everything. I can put it wow. on rain delay, all kinds of things. Yeah, they're it's really nice. nice. It makes it. I had an, before I had my smart one, I had an old Rainbird one, a manual one, and that was painful to set up if anyone has set up a manual one. And the, then you get the smart ones and they're a, 
really easy. So I'm curious, we do know Greg has one. Does anyone else here have a smart controller? Anyone else on a controller or are you just manual? I'm on a Rainbird, the little ones, you know, those little, yeah. little controllers. Yeah. And they break every few years. So I yeah. when you said you had one for 20 years, I'm like, Shh, I've gone through four in 20 years. Yeah. Consider getting um, one of the smart ones because they cost more, but they're so much easier to manage. Most people are a lot of Rainbirds. Um, uh, and water some have an easy, simple controller, not a smart one. Rainbird, manual Rainbird. Uh, yeah, they're mostly Rainbird. That's what you get at, uh, you know, Lowe's. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, but now they're also selling them the smart ones. Mm -hmm. Mine's called Orbit. The name of my manufacturer is Orbit. Smith is asking for a tour, Greg. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'd be glad to give you a little tour. I'll show you how one time I did a test on my one of my uh, zones and the water was shooting out clear across my yard and watering my neighbor's car. Hmm. So I check my water more routinely now. Oh, that's... So what about grass? Grass, believe it or not, has turned into a very controversial subject in the US. Um, it's, um, we use about in the U S about 9 billion gallons of water a day for gas and mowers consume 200 million gallons of gas. Um, and then fertilizers, which are petroleum based and the carbon footprint is about what? 25 million tons for our lawns. So it is not. Lawns are not environmental, we positive. They are environmentally negative. They're not considered, they're, and especially in a place like California, we are watering something that is, has virtually no benefit. They're a monoculture. Um, and so they're a complete wasteland for um, the butterfly and bird populations. And they're an invasive species. So they, there is nothing really positive except people who grew up with a lawn think that's what you're supposed to have. And My God, you would not be popular in Tennessee. They love their lawn there. Where, where is that? Tennessee. I, I, I oh. was just floored, floored acres and acres and acres of just mowed lawns. It was yeah. amazing. Well, yeah. but there's also a difference between places. I grew up on the other side of the Mississippi and where they get rain. I mean, when I go back where I grew up, they, they talk about there has, there's a drought, it hasn't rained in three days. Literally, they will say, there is, we are in the middle of a drought, it's only rained twice this week. And so in the middle of the summer. So, and they consider it shocking when they have to sprinkle, bring out the sprinkler for their lawn to keep it green. Like, look at that, those people had to bring a sprinkler out. You see how bad it is? So, which is completely different than what we have right here, where we're in a drought and we don't see rain for months and months and months. So here we are putting all of this water into something that provides really no benefit except, I guess some people think um, it's aesthetically pleasing or what you're supposed to have. So, a lot of people then move and say, move to the next thing. They say, well, I'll just put fake turf out there, which is, it sounds like a great solution, but it's actually environmentally ghastly. It is a heat sink. So it's rubber, it's hot. Um, it creates water runoff. So even though they poke little holes in it, it still creates underneath that rubber mat, um, there's nothing. It kills healthy soil bacteria, worms, and root systems of trees. It's a good way to long-term kill a tree. It's plastic and rubber. It's not recyclable. It's toxic. And 
you know, we've lost a third of all the birds in this country. We need bugs to feed the birds. So we completely, when you use fake turf, it is a terrible habitat to have around our house. But people like it because they don't have to mow it and it's green. So you say, we can't use all these invasive species of grass. We can't use fake turf. I love my grass, what should I do? Well, there is a solution, believe it or not. There's lawn alternatives now, native sod for residential areas. And the same places that are creating sod where you buy sod, the sod farms, are also having native sod. And behind uh, the picture behind there is one of my neighbors who put in native sod. Um, you only need to mow it twice a year. You mow it in the spring and you, you mow it in the fall. It uses 60% less water. So you just need to have an inch, instead of an inch a week, you have an inch a month. You just water it once a month if you want it to be green and lush. If you don't in the summer care if it gets a little brown, it will come back to life because it's native. But if you want it to stay green all year round, you need to water it once a month. Uh, you don't need to fertilize it. It increases the bird and butterfly population because it's native. Um, it stores more carbon because its root system is very natively very deep. Um, you can either put in sod, which is the rolled out, they come out and they roll it out, or you can buy plugs, which are, um, you go to the store and you buy the native sod in a pot. And there's a bunch of different kinds. Um, it really depends upon aesthetically what you want. So I, the, that gets into landscape gardening. So I'm not gonna get into the different types, but there's a whole bunch of different kinds. If you just, um, Google um, native sod for, and you put Santa Clara County, you will get up a whole, you know, cause you want to get something that's right for Northern California. There's a bunch of sod farms like a, a between here and Sacramento and they all have native sod and they have about five, six different varietals depending on if you want tall sod, if you want short sod, if you want mowing sod, but if you are someone that says, no, 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 I need to have my green lawn, you really should consider at some point in time putting in a native lawn. That is the environmentally healthiest choice and it also uses the least amount of water. So I'm wondering if anyone has already looked at getting rid of their invasive turf and putting in something that's native. I have. Oh, yay, cool. We just, um, we just filled in our pool with a 40,000 gallon pool. <laughs> so we just buried it. And um, I'm going to put in, we're going to put in a uh, dry rock bed, dry river bed with some um, grasses and native plant. It's going to be a mix of native and grasses, you know, like decorative ornamental grasses and some other native flowers and stuff. We haven't decided all of it, but oh, we're fantastic. planning it now. And also we're gonna do the front yard. We're not sure what we're gonna do at the front, but we're getting rid of the lawn. But, so we will not have any lawn, hopefully I got rid of spring. my lawn. I don't know how much it is right now, but the Santa Clara water has a rebate if you get rid of your lawn. If you're planning on doing anything that's going to be, uh, and anything doing with your lawn or, you know, first thing you should do is go look at Santa Clara Water District. They've got all kinds of rebates. And um, I got them for my front yard and my backyard. And it wasn't that hard. It takes about three months. Um, turnaround time. You've got to take pictures of what you, what it looks like before. You have to tell them what you're going to do. And then you have to take a picture of what you did. And you send it into them and they send you money. So nice program. So the next step, and I think Karen, what you just said le le leads us into the next step is designing a water wise garden. So the big goal for designing water wise gardens, what we're trying to do if we wanna have a water wise garden is we wanna use less water, we wanna create water sinks and we wanna avoid heat sinks. 
So this was done about 10, 15 years, 2004. Oh my gosh, almost 20 years ago. But there was um, um, an organization that did a cost benefit analysis between putting, to, putting in a California garden as opposed to a traditional back East garden, which is lawn and non-native plants. And the construction cost you can see is um, higher, but that's because if you actually dig down, they did um, construction things that they didn't do for the traditional yard. Like they did um, water permeable surfaces. So that, that is more expensive if you do water permeable. Instead of doing um, cement, you put in a water permeable um, surface. So, the, so um, but the plants are about the same. There's, it's not like native plants cost more than um, East Coast and European plants. Um, the water usage, you save a lot of money in the long. So it's pretty much just to show that over a 10 year period of time, you're gonna save a lot of money with water use, green waste and maintenance. So there's another expression out there that you're gonna hear people use a lot, which is climate positive design. So climate positive design, and that's our goal. Once we, you know, the first part of this presentation was how do we, our, what we currently have, how do we use our water better? And the second piece is when you're putting in and you're designing a garden, how do you design a better garden for water use? So if we want to design a better garden, what we want is climate positive design, which is we want to cool down our property. We want to keep our property cool. So we want to decrease heat sinks and we want to increase water sinks. So the best way, the number one thing that will cool down a lot is a large tree. Bar nothing else, a large tree is the best possible thing you can have in your yard. Um, number two is green space over cement or rubber. Um, and then using bushes, plants, mulch instead of lawns. What is green space over cement or rubber? What does that mean? So a lot of people will, you know, paving, like if you look at our streets and our driveways, and then people will have big patios, and then people say, I don't want to deal with anything. So they pave over their entire yard, their front yard, their backyard. So that's really a heat sink. When you, when you walk into a property that the whole entire property is pavement and there's no plants, you've got a roof and you've got cement, and all you have is a heat sink. Just, it just gets hotter and hotter and hotter. It's like going into a city, which just has buildings and um, roadways or a heat sink. And plants create cooler environments. In urban, and <coughs> in urban environments, they're looking at how do they can bring plants into urban environments to cool down cities. Like um, having roofs, living roofs are a big one. Um, and I saw a study recently that they had done in Chicago with cool roofs, which are planted roofs like what they have in San Francisco for the um, Academy of Science is a cool roof, a planted roof, and how it brought down temperatures like 20 degrees. So trees can bring down temperatures. We all know, we walk down the street in the summer, and if you're underneath a tree, it's 10, 15 degrees cooler than just at the other side of the tree. So that's, that's what it is. So I'm sure you all realize that we live in what's referred to as a Mediterranean climate. So there's a few other places in the world that have a climate similar to us. There's some areas in Chile. There's some areas in South Africa. There are some areas in Australia. And then we have around the Mediterranean basin. So when you're looking to buy plants for our area, Natives are the best because they're from here. And the second best is getting a Mediterranean plant. So plants from South Africa, Australia, Mediterranean, or Central Chile. 
So that's what we should be aiming for. Now, of course, that doesn't include our vegetables. We're going to get vegetables from all over the world. But for the rest of our garden, we should really be looking at Mediterranean plants because they do really well here. And all of these climates, what we have in common is there's no rain in the summer in any of these climates. So these are plants that do really well in dry conditions. And this is the time for them. This is when you plant natives. This is when you plant Mediterranean. They like being planted right now between now and March from about the October to March is when you want to plant them because there's all this water and this is when they establish themselves and they go uh, where uh, back east and European plants go dormant in the winter. Our plants tend to come alive in the summer and go dormant, a little bit more dormant in the, our plants go alive in the winter and are dormant in the summer. So when we produce, when we build drought tolerant gardens, what we find is using Mediterranean plants use 83% less water than back East and European plants. That's why we're talking about using them. They generate 56% less green waste and they create, they require 68% less maintenance. So they're much, much easier to manage. So Karen, you said you were going to be putting in a Mediterranean garden. Much easier to manage than a uh, European or back East garden. Yeah. <laughs> so what else can we do? Well, mulch is another big element. Beside the Mediterranean garden, mulch. And mulch is a layer that protects our soil. So organic bark chips or inorganic like pebbles and stones are mulch. And that's what we put on top of the sur surface, which is different than compost. People a lot of times confuse mulch and compost. Compost provides the soil with nutrients. And then when you go to the store, Typically what you want to do, like if you're putting in, let's say a new vegetable garden, you set aside your area, you wanna put about two inches of compost on top because there's all these great nutrients. You don't really need to be feeding all kinds of chemicals to your plants. The best possible way you can get in good nutrients to your plants is two inches of compost. So when you go to the store to buy compost, make sure you're not buying mulch. Make sure you're buying compost and make sure it has at least 40% some type of animal poop in it. It's the poop that helps the plants. So it could be horse, it could be cow, it could be um, chicken, um, or it could be worm. All of that, when they say castings, that's just a fancy name for poop. So what we want to have, because that has all the nitrogen in it. So what we want is and it's natural nitrogen as opposed to chemical nitrogen. And the plants like that natural nitrogen. So what we wanna do is put, you know, over our plants so there's nutrients coming in, we wanna put compost, but we also then want to do mulch on top of our compost. So mulch is a layer um, that protects our soil. So probably one of the more popular kinds of mulch is bark chips. And bark chips are excellent. They hold in water, they prevent weed growth, they reduce water evaporation, and organic mulches provide helpful bacteria for earthworms and beneficial fungi. So organic bark chips are wonderful. Inorganic, what I find terrible, that I would not recommend using is rubber. Because a lot of times those are you know, chewed up tires and you're like, yes, but they didn't throw into a landfill. Yeah, they're toxic. And if you use tires, you know, chewed up tires, don't ever use that on top of anything you're going to eat because you're now creating a toxic waste dump for your, um, your plants. So you should really avoid inorganic like rubber, um, what you should also consider is inorganic. I personally don't like inorganic for my personal garden. I don't use pebbles and stones uh, because I like the inorganic because if I want to grow something, I don't have to worry about getting rocks out of it. I've got nice healthy soil. 
where you really want to use pebbles and stones is if you're in a high fire area and you definitely want to use it around your house. So um, high fire area, stones don't burn where you can sit there and say, you've got all these bark chips and I live in a high fire area. I don't know how high fire your area is. I know there's some houses near the um, hills. Um, yeah, it's, you know, I, I don't know. I, I, I kind of worry that it's a medium fire area because of the hills, but you know, it, it's, it's hard to say. We don't have a lot of large, you know, it's not a forest or anything like that. You just probably just have mostly grass. grass. Yeah, yeah. Grass friends. Yeah. yeah. So but there are a lot of, mm, yeah, a lot of what they're doing to mitigate, I'm sure you guys all know is like give having 20 feet between the, um, breaks where it's mowed down the grasslands. They probably go up in the grasslands behind your- yeah, They um, come right, yeah, right mountain. against the housing fences about 20 feet, yes, every, right, every right. year. So that mitigates a lot of the problems so that within your garden, it's not gonna make a big difference. You guys aren't living in paradise, no. in California, where you have to really worry about this stuff. Um, so you'll see pebbles and stones when you go up into the hills of different neighborhoods that people are living right up into the hills and what they need to do is really protect their houses. So the best mulch for them isn't bark chips, it's pebbles so that, you know, you can still plant underneath pebbles. I personally prefer organic mulch because um, it creates a healthier soil than pebbles. There's no nutrients in pebbles. So, I need. Mean, I have a few uh, questions in the sure. chat about the mulching and stuff. Um, so somebody asked about fallen leaves. Is that a, a good to just let them lay and act the mulch? Yeah, mul fallen leaves, especially this time of year. Um, one of the, you know, we people talk about worms and they are so happy about their worms. Um, the worms that we use in our garden are in an invasive species. They're from Europe and they're destroying our forests. So the native plants, so if you have native trees, American trees, trees from the Americas, South America, Central America, North America, they don't want, they, how American trees work is their tree, the leaves fall, they start to disintegrate over the winter and they feed, the leaves feed the tree that they fell from. So the best thing you can do in the winter is not rake up the leaves under your tree because you want them to disintegrate under your tree and free, feed your tree. In the springtime when they, you know, there's not that much left of those leaves and there's not that many nutrients, then you can clean up your garden, but you really shouldn't clean your garden up in the fall. And if you have some mow blow and go guys, you don't want them pulling all of your leaves out from underneath your trees. I just noticed with my trees, just in the last day or so, there's a lot of leaves that all of a sudden are starting to fall. And I'm not, I'm not picking them up because this is the best time of year for those leaves to fall. The rain is gonna come, those nutrients are gonna get into the soil and you're gonna feed your trees, especially native trees. Okay. Then somebody else uh, just had a comment. They thought bark chips are high in carbon content, so we're requiring more nitrogen in order to avoid starving the plants. I have never heard that. I have no idea how to respond. Okay. Uh, somebody else asked about grass clippings. Are they okay for bushes and tree mulch? Oh, grass clippings are great. Okay. You could be using them for mulch. That's a, it's a fantastic mulch to be using. And then somebody else asked, uh, they wanted to clarify that uh, you said our earthworms are invasive. Yeah, that the earthworms that you like, if you get, yes, earthworms are invasive. Wow. In invasive species. And then uh, somebody, um, Smitha asked about the new statewide mandate for green waste recycling. Are you aware of anything about that? No. Okay. I can't help you. Well, we'll skip that. Uh, let's see. Um, okay, I think that's it. Oh, if somebody was asking if you know of a free source for a free a free source for compost or mulch. Well, 
I don't know in your town. I know in my town, um, the city has, you can get mulch. You can call up the city and they'll dump up a whole bunch of mulch at your house if you call them up. Mm. Um, so you should check. I don't know because every town is different. I also know that you can call some of the tree companies because they have to mulch all that stuff up. And um, I don't know if they charge or they don't charge, but a lot of the tree companies are always looking to get rid of, it's gone through their chipper shredder and now they want to get rid of it. Huh. So that's a good place to go to, to find out about it. You should also look, you can um, like Google in your area to find out if there's anyone, because any of the places, the horse, the barns, they have a lot of manure and horse manure is great because, you know, they eat hay. So it's, you know, it's not like, you know, that that's what you want. Um, you want, um, that kind of manure, but you want to make sure it's been taken care of to find. So you don't want to get fresh manure. You want to get find someone who has um, uh, composted it. So that gets back to the compost. So um, you can do a Google search and see if anyone is composting, you know, um, find if there's local compost as opposed to like going down to Lowe's or Summer Winds or one of those places and getting a bag of compost. Because for your yard, you're going to need you, you're going to need a lot more than a bag or two. Okay. So something else to consider are Hugel berms, and Hugel is hill in German. So this came to us from Germany. But what they and um, the landscape designers are starting to do this. Um, I attended a water summit with the Santa Clara Water District where they talked about hugel berms a couple of years ago. And um, what hugel culture is, is you take, if you're, if you're, you know, if you're redoing your yard and it's flat, you probably want to create some berms so it's interesting in your yard. So what are you going to use to create this little hill in your yard? Well, what they're finding is if you take down large bushes or trees, instead of having to get rid of these large bushes or trees, you cut them up and you take the bigger pieces and you put them on the bottom and the smaller pieces you stack on top and you fill it in with dirt and you plant right into, and which it, you've now created a berm using um, the tree, um, using the limbs, using the basis of the tree. And what happens is trees, dead trees, are like sponges. They absorb a lot of water and they slowly let that water out over the course of the year. So what you're creating is a water sink. And then you plant into that berm and instead of planting into a berm that was created with just plain dirt or because that's a lot of times what they do is it's just plain dirt, um, which isn't a water sink. It just the water will run through it. We're now creating a water sink in, of our berm. So that's the goal. And eventually your berm will get shorter, but any berm you build over time will get shorter. But if you build it out of um, wood, you've now created a water sink. So it's something else to consider if you're landscaping or planning on doing a backyard project to take your existing bushes and trees that you're taking down and using them as the basis of a berm. Um, something else, because we're trying to create water sinks and we're trying to get rid of heat sinks. So another way to create a water sink, I think Karen was saying that she's planning on having a rock garden. So, I, a, um, a, and it's called a rain garden. So what you do is you build a three foot deep hole or path and you fill it with rocks. That's how simple it is. Three feet deep, fill it with rocks. And when it rains, there's a place because there's a lot of holes between the rocks. So there's a place for the water to go. And then because it's sitting in there, it has time to seep in. One of the biggest areas we have 
big issues. One of the biggest issues we have in Santa Clara County is with so much paving, our water table is highly affected by all the paving and all the roofs we have. And so what we need to have are more water sinks so that we can um, get the water into our water table. And that's what this does. So a rain garden is a good way of helping to replenish our water table. So you sit there and say, well, I just have one little yard. But if all of us with one little yard had a, um, a rain garden, we would really make a big difference in um, our county. So um, it just, as it says here, it allows 30% more water to soak into the ground and it removes up to 90% of the nutrients and chemicals in the sediments from rainwater. So it really, really is helpful to our, um, um, our aquafilters. And, and we also have, I think I have down here a $300 Valley Water, um, a $300 rebate from Valley Water if you put in a rain garden. Mm. So something else that people don't think about, roofs. The largest single structure on most of our real estate is the roof. And roofs can be a huge heat sink. Um, they don't only heat up your house, they heat up your yard. So they did a study, this was down in Southern California. They did a study and they found that by putting a cooler roof in, they cut air conditioning costs seven to 15% and they cut um, water usage by about 9%. So, um, when you're looking, if you need to get a new roof, I'm not saying go out and get a new roof right now, but when you need to get a new roof, you should be looking at getting a cool roof. Um, that's a picture of my roof. It's a cool roof. It's 25%. Uh, um, what you look at when you're looking at roofs, they have one of the metrics that you look at is solar reflection. And what you want is a roof with more than 25% solar reflection. So, um, it's not just asphalt roofs, metal roofs. You should be able, you should find out what their um, solar reflection is. White roofs, spray foam roofs, find out what their um, reflection rate is. And what you, the goal is to find something that's higher than 25%. About the highest you can get right now is about 50%. Um, they're not very popular in Northern California because they tend to be very, very pale, um, like a pale yellow, a pale green, a white roof. And we just really haven't accepted those color roofs in um, Northern California, whereas um, a reflective roof is now law in Southern California. You can't put on a non-reflective roof in Southern California. But if you're putting on a new roof, I don't think anyone from the street, no one from the street can tell that my roof is a reflective roof. It looks the exact same. Um, it uses the exact same materials, except for the very top. On the surface for most of the asphalt tiles, they use like a sand so that people don't slip on it when they're walking across it. And for mine, they use a reflective material and it gives them 25% um, higher reflection. So the roof works the same. The guys that install it's the same. It's just the material they put at the very end process is more reflective. So I'm curious, do people have heat sinks in their yard or water sinks or do, have you never thought about it? And the first step is knowing that there are these alternatives out there. We only got one reply. No, never thought about it. I, I never, I mean, I'm thinking about it, but for other reasons, I didn't know it was a water sink. <laughs> I just thought they're cool and they're, you know, drought tolerant. Oh, for your, um, for my dry river rain. bed. Yeah. yeah. Oh, Barbara's asking, should she replace her lawn with mounds and rock paths? Oh, that'd be great. I personally think that it's a so much more interesting yard when you have mounds and rock paths and plants than just some grass. Well, we were going to do mounds. Now I'm really, I'm, I kind of wish I would have 
known before because we could have we did get rid of a lot of brush that we could have chopped up and you know for a hokel for yeah but you know figure that out Lynn thinks she might have a heat sink because they have a lot of concrete in the back. Well, there's ways to lessen your heat sink. It's called pots of plants, you know, planted, pot, you know, plant pots, plants in pots, and larger plants in pots. Yeah, I have a, I have a lot of pots. They're not huge ones, but. Plants make a huge difference. Yes. Barbara says, have toy on boughs, good native source for a berm. What, oh. I'm not sure what a toy on bough is. Well, toy on is a native plant and they get big. Well, it depends upon which version of toy on you have. And yeah, you can cut off your, your toy on and you cut it up and you can use it as the, to fill in a berm. But mm -hmm. a lot of us just don't think if we're going to build a berm in our yard that we should be using wood to put into that berm. Does it and disintegrate? It, it, it does disintegrate, but it takes a long time to disintegrate. If you have a redwood tree, it could take 100 years to disintegrate. So they take a long, long time to disintegrate. But um, depending on the plant, but it still, it doesn't just, it just turns into, it looks to us like dirt. But in the process, it's um, it becomes a it's a water sink. So it's really positive for our environment. Hmm. So the next step is getting started. So you're saying, okay, you've told me all of these things. How do I even go start get started? I've got this green grass lawn, and what should be the first thing I do? And the first thing you should do is map your yard. So this is a picture of my yard. Very, very simple picture of my yard. As you can see, I've got a rectangle in front of my house with a path, not quite in the middle. And you, there, you can see there is green and there is gray. Gray is shade, green is sun. And I went out three times during the day. I drew this very simple picture. And I said, where is it shade and where is it sunny in the morning? in the midday and in the afternoon. And you can see, I kind of have the um, right side of the screen, it's pretty shady in the morning and the left side is really sunny. It's mostly sunny the entire day in my front yard in the middle part. And then it's kind of a little bit dappled sunlight in a couple of areas in the late afternoon. And the reason I want to have this, and I need to know where north, south, east, and west is, is if I want to buy plants and I go to um, the nursery, they're going to say to me, they're going to ask me a couple questions. And I might say, oh, well, I like purple plants. And they're going to say, yeah, is it shady or sunny? Is it morning sun or evening sun? And then I have no idea. But if I created a little map like this, now I know. I know if I want to put a plant in my the um, top left or the, the top of each of those rectangles is the street. So by the street to the left, it's sunny all day long over there. So I want a plant that likes all day long sun. If I want to put a plant in the top right of my yard, I know that it's shady in the morning and then it gets afternoon sun because there's some plants that like shade in the morning and they like sun in the afternoon. And when you go to a nursery and you wanna get plants, they're gonna ask you these questions. So if you create this little map, you don't have, you don't have to know which plants you can go to a nursery and say, can someone help me? And what plants, because they'll tell you which plants based on what your needs are. And it literally took me about 15 minutes to create this map. 
As you can see, it's very simple. And all I did is three times in the morning, in the afternoon, in the around noon time, and in the late afternoon, I went out and said, where is it shady and where is it sunny? So creating a map is really helpful if you're gonna go plant, buy plants. The next question that you need to have is, what type of plants do you want? Do you want edibles or ornamentals or both? I like flowers, so I buy a lot of flowers. Um, consider natives, they do the best here. They're the best for the uh, birds and the bees because the birds and the bees and uh, the butterflies, they need natives. And you plant natives and you're gonna make your neighborhood, the, the birds and the bees, and the butterflies happy. And also consider watering needs. If you buy natives, you have a lot less watering, which saves you money. Um, and a good place to start if you're trying to figure out what plants and you're doing it on your own is UC Davis has what they call their Arboretum All-Stars. So they have about a hundred plants that do wonderfully in this area. So it's a good place to start to see what plants do well. So you can just put in Arboretum All-Stars into Google and it will take you there. Or if you can't remember, you can just go to UC Davis and ask about, you know, if you can, you can put in things like uh, UC Davis uh, recommended plants and it will come up with Arboretum All-Stars. Anita, will, will, we, will we, we be getting a copy of this presentation? Will you be I able to? Sure, I'd be more than okay. happy to share it, um, Karen. I have your uh, email yeah. address. I can send you over a, um, I will uh, put this up on uh, Box and send you over a link. Okay, great. So have I convinced any of you? Do any of you want to install California natives after this talk? Yes. <laughs> So to summarize, we wanna cut water usage by drip irrigation, mulch, proper watering techniques and planting natives. And we wanna save water by replacing our lawns, creating water sinks and cutting heat sinks. And that's it. Thank you. Any questions? You've been asking questions all along. <laughs> that was an awesome presentation. I learned so much. Very interesting. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. A lot of good comments. Uh, the Petrak say it was a very, very informative presentation. Um, one, one other question we didn't really get to. Um, I think Herb wanted to know about gray water, gray watering systems. And what do you think about those? Oh, I think they're great. For those of you that don't know, it's taking typically what they recommend is from your washing machine. There is also a rebate program at Santa Clara Water District. I sound like I work for Santa Clara Water District. I don't, but I just know about these programs. Um, they have some you know, great programs where they talk about how to manage your yard. So I'm a real fan of their programs they have there, but they have a really good program where they tell you what you should do and what you shouldn't do for gray water and they have a rebate. So it's taking the water, instead of sending your gray water from your washing machine down the drain, it's using it to water your lawn or your plants. But doesn't the chemicals in the dish and the detergent and the bleach kill them? I don't, I, now you're talking about something I don't know about, but I don't think so. Because hmm. they talk about using gray water. Wow. The whole program. Um, I think that was it. If anybody has any questions that I haven't um, addressed on your behalf, oh, uh, somebody mentioned rain barrels. I guess that's kind of a, a, a type of gray water. Well, not really gray water, but. Another way, yeah. We, yeah. I have some rain barrels. I just got two. I haven't used, I mean, they're full. Um, they got full in the last rain. Yeah, I yeah. Really used the water yet. Yeah, we have a little pond and we use it for our pond to fill up the water for the pond. How do you collect the rainwater? Do you put it underneath your uh, spouts? Or? Yep. So the runoff from the roof goes. So usually the first rain of the season, we don't 
use it, use it to collect because there's just so much sediment on the roof. And then uh, we have a little bit of a filter over it. So it's just water and not leaves and crap going in. Somebody else has asked, uh, and Barbara, um, what, what's the best time to measure the shade, you know, do your mapping summer or winter? Well, you want to do it. Yeah. You, um, most of us plant for the winter. I mean the summer. So I, you know, June is a good time of year, May, June timeframe. Cause you're, you know, May, June, July timeframe, the sun is all high. So probably late spring, early summer is when you want to do it. It's right. not going to be that much difference throughout the summer. Okay. Well, thank you so much. That was really, uh, I, I mean, just great information. I haven't heard a lot of the stuff that you taught us tonight. So it's well, really great. good. Great. That's good to know. And a lot of good comments. You know, everybody is saying wonderful presentation, very, very informative, all kinds of good comments. So. Thank you for joining us. So now and now your goal is to go out there and tell your neighbors about this. Do you know you're not cycling your water? You should consider recycling your water. <laughs> so I can get yeah. some more ambassadors, turn all of you guys into ambassadors so you can go tell all your neighbors to <laughs> cycle their water and create hoogles. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, so yeah, send me the presentation yep. and then I'll, we'll, we'll send it out to our whole uh, listserv okay, um, great. as well as the people that attended here. Great. I'll put it and then you could just send the link and they can just download yes. it. Great. Thank okay. you very much. You okay. Stop, you can stop sharing now. I need okay. Oh, <laughs> Anita. Thank you. Okay. So we do, we, do we have a few pieces of business to uh, finish off with? Okay. Am I no longer sharing? Yes. No, I think I still see your screen. It's still sharing. Now just, yeah. Um, oh, yeah, it says stop sharing. Sorry. There we go. There you go. Thank you okay. very much. Thank you. Have a good evening. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you all. Thanks. Nice meeting you. Nice meeting you. Thank you all for the good questions. That was great. Thank you for organizing that. See you all. Oh, we're done. We don't have to talk. You're leaving. Well, I thought we were doing something about quarterly meeting dates. I, yeah, or sorry. Set, up, <laughs> set up dates for the next quarter meetings. Are we? I don't. I, but I think I think the point of that was just that we that we we don't have them set yet, but we we will um, send out information once we've set them. We need to court. There's some calendar coordination that has to take place to to make that happen. Yeah. We, we usually do that at the board meeting. We do usually yeah. do that at the first board meeting in January. Okay. Well, sounds good. And stay we'll, tuned send, we'll send it out when yeah, we Yeah, stay tuned, have people. <laughs> hey, okay. uh, Greg, or, yeah. yeah, go ahead. Smita. Sorry. Um, if any of you are talking to the city, um, this law about <laughs> composting, statewide mandate that all cities start composting green waste and food scraps is supposed to go into effect. January 1st, but apparently cities were threatening to sue. And so now they've said they can have up to 2023 to actually implement it, but mm -hmm. haven't heard a thing from San Jose. And I've been asking Sergio and all of that because it's nuts. Every other place around gives people little green bins and you can throw your food scraps into that and then chuck that into your green waste and have it composted because you know, the, the green waste in the landfills turn degrades into methane, mm. um, which is a very bad greenhouse gas as well as a fire hazard. So, um, and, and then we could get more free compost too. <laughs> so I'd love to know what the city, what San Jose is doing. Cause I, I haven't heard a thing about it. I don't think we're on the ball with it at all. Have you talked, you said you've talked to Sergio? I think I mentioned it to Sergio years ago and he said, oh my God, you don't want to get into the garbage. It's it's so complicated. I do think it's kind of like a mafia thing. So <laughs> I don't want to mess with it. I remember talking to Ash Calra about it too. And he's like, no, 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 no. I don't want to talk about this. Oh, that's worth uh -huh. exploring further. I think we should yeah. explore it further. 
I, I'd like to, when you talk, want to come over and see the little demo, I, we can talk about that. I think we yeah, should. Yeah, thank you. I'll we send you the, the story as well. The LA Times had one. And... Mm. Yeah, that was a great presentation. Yeah. I really like that. Thank you. Okay, I think we're done then, right? All right. Okay. We get to go eat dinner. Everyone. Well, then had dinner. Happy holidays. <laughs> eat some dinner, Karen. Okay. Bye. Happy holidays. Take care. Happy bye. holidays. Bye. Bye. Yeah. Bye. Bye, bye. See ya. See y'all. <laughs> Teresa and John, thank you for coming. Hi, Greg. We'll <laughs> yeah. see you. Bye bye. Bye. Bye bye. Hey, Greg? Yeah. Did I understand yes. it correctly? We're, good. We're now going to be in District 10? Um, that hasn't been fully decided yet, John. They're still working on the, the redistricting max. I watched yeah. uh, I watched the meeting, um, planning commission meeting last night until about 12 o'clock. And uh, Sergio and Matt Mahan, who's a District 10 council member, um, kind of switched things back so that it was more normal because it would the unity map they call it the unity map would put us in district 10 you're right but san jose i think is only going to consider a modified version of that next uh december 14th next tuesday so if you're interested in hearing exactly everything that's the big meeting at the san jose council evening time okay so that would would, would that mean uh we would um no longer have Sergio as our council? That's correct. If it happens that way. All right, we'll, we'll see what happens. Yeah, we'll kind of see what happens. I think um, it, yeah, it, I, I, what I heard last night, it might not happen. Yeah, yeah. Uh, who, who's the councilman in District Matt, 10? Matt Mahan. I don't know anything about him. He's a fairly new guy. He's only been there less than a year, I think. Oh, okay. Johnny uh, I'm real happy with Sergio, so I hate to lose him. Yeah. All right, Greg. Hey, hey. go get some dinner. Yeah. Uh, good talking to you and have a happy holiday. And I appreciate your posts that you send me every so often. Oh, yeah. Thank uh, you for yours. That last okay. one, just amazing that one I sent you, that one. Couldn't believe it. I'm sorry? That one I sent you, that really uh, ast astonishing. Oh, yeah. It was amazing. Yeah, that, that that was that was great. Yeah. So well, thank you for the ones I put that time. in my blog. <laughs> okay. Good weekend. Take care. All right. Bye for now. Bye bye. Bye bye.